Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Leah Rosen, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We've muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our speaker in the chat window on your screen. After the presentation, we will begin the question and answer portion because this is, after all, Ask the Expert. And I will ask our speaker your questions from the chat window. Your questions in the chat window will only be visible to myself and our speaker. You're welcome to type them in at any time during the presentation. Again, thank you for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dominic Clark from Charter Medical. Hello, and thank you all for joining. Today I'll provide an overview of a new product recently introduced by Charter Medical designed to enable closed system processing for working cell bank applications. In reviewing an example of a typical cell expansion or seed train scale up, small 1 ml cryovials for working cell banks are commonly used to initiate the scale up process. Files are removed from liquid or vapor nitrogen storage, thawed, and the cells are then removed from the screw cap vials through an open process into a small shake flask, typically. Cells are then cultured and scaled up over time before ultimately being transferred to a large bioreactor. This process, while common and generally effective, requires multiple open handling and processing steps. In addition, to the small working cell bank starting volumes, the scale-up process as a whole typically takes a couple of weeks on average. And while standard, areas for improvement and optimization exist. For working cell banks, cryovials are the most commonly used containers as previously mentioned. The processes are well established and have been generally accepted to this point. But with the advances in single use and demands for closed systems, higher quality, and increased efficiency, this part of the seed train process is now lagging. Alternative options exist, but they haven't been optimized to support the requirements. Uh, when you look at single-use cryo storage bags that are available, they have a long history of use in the blood and transfusion industry to support the ultra-low temperature needs, but the tubing is a limitation resulting ultimately in open system processing. If you look at bulk storage containers, these also exist and are common. Tubing on these is weldable, but none of the cryo storage, cryo storage uh, components are designed or rated for use with temperatures below minus 80 degrees C. Cryogenic storage containers are available and commonly used, but as we can see, uh, the freezable welding tubing has been a limitation to this point. Because of this product limitation and the increasing demands for closed system processing and commercial efficiency, Charter Medical has developed and introduced FP Flex. The new FP Flex cold chain tubing and freeze pack cryogenic storage containers have been designed for ultra low minus 196 degrees Celsius frozen storage and transport application, enabling closed system continuous processing. The new FP Flex tubing is the first of its kind and typically uses, typical uses include working cell banks, bulk intermediates, and final fill applications. The proprietary thermal plastic tubing is unitized to the industry proven freeze pack cryogenic storage containers and both are validated for use to minus 196 degrees C. The FP Flex tubing is not only weldable to itself following cryogenic storage but also to the bioprocess industry standard C-Flex and is compatible with standard welding and sealing devices. The full validation package is available upon demand. So the general concept for working cell banks is rather simple. You would take your traditional working cell bank scale-up process as previously discussed and shown here and instead insert the FP-Flex containers in place of that vial. A traditional method, again, requires multiple open handling steps and scale-up times, whereas the FP-Flex method can now be designed as a single-step, closed-system process, ultimately reducing handling and production scale-up times.
Depending on your process requirements, the FPFlex product family offers a variety of standard sizes and options. Bag sizes range from nominal fill volumes of 50 ml to 1,000 ml, with working fill volumes ranging from 10 ml to 400 ml in liquid or vapor nitrogen storage. Standard products are also available in either the A or B versions. The A style, as shown here, comes equipped with two flex lines. One can be used for filling, which would then be sealed off, and the other line would be remaining on the product when it's frozen, and then post uh, removal is available for post storage and thaw removal. The A versions are more applicable to traditional bioprocessing applications, whereas the Flex B version shown here is geared more towards the cell therapy applications. The difference, the B products are equipped with one Flex line as well as a one EVA to PVC line. The EVA to PVC line can be sterile welded for filling purposes and subsequently sealed off and removed prior to freezing, and the Flex line will remain on uh, for closed system removal post-thaw. This slide highlights some general FPFlex tubing information. The FPFlex tubing is currently available as part of the freeze pack bag in a quarter inch OD by eighth inch ID size. Other sizes will be available in the future following validation. For tube welding, welding and sealing, FPFlex is intended to be compatible with the current industry available welding and sealing devices as listed. Thermo device was used for the majority of the product validation studies. And if the traditional tube sealer isn't available, pinch pipes and crimpers such as the Nova Seal device can be used for custom applications. For general freezing and thawing, standard, standard industry offered reusable aluminum storage cassettes are available and should be used. The cassettes have been designed to maintain a one centimeter thickness of the product for consistent freezing and thawing purposes and is similar to that of a cryovile. Therefore, minimal changes to your current freezing process are required. So next, I'll briefly share some of the testing and supporting data generated for the intended use of the FPFlex products. As stated previously, a full validation study has been completed and is available for the product family. Test data depicted on this slide highlights some of the key physical aspects of both the freeze pack film and the FP flex tubing, which combined are critical to the balance of durability and flexibility needed of the products to handle the physical demands of the storage at cryogenic temperatures. This slide shows some of the physical test data to support the final container following irradiation, which includes standard USP class six cytotoxicity, hemolysis, as well as also USP 788 testing for particulates. In addition to the general physical testing, extractable testing was performed in the FPFlex final containers. I call extractable testing, the conditions tested are intended to be worst case based on the intended use of the products. In this case, the intended use, of course, being cryogenic storage. FPFlex Containers are intended to be used to store cells, tissues, and bulk biopharmaceutical drug formulations for applications to temperatures as low as minus 196C. Extractable test conditions do therefore have a much greater potential of generating potential extractables when compared to typical product use. For the extraction, common solutions used include neutral CH with the acidified and caustic with the as well as 50% ethanol and also 20% DMSO in water. DMSO is commonly used cryoprotectant added to the media for banking down cells, and a 10% solution or less is typical. Samples were maintained at 40 degrees C and tested. Testing was conducted at 0, 3, 30, and 90 days post storage using a combination of standard test methods. The extracts observed were generally expected either due to typical degradation products of the film itself, slip agents, or polymer additives. A full analysis can be provided upon request. So 
combined with the collected physical test data, a number of studies were performed based on the intended use of the FPFLEX products. In addition to general sterility testing, dive penetration testing was performed along with a microbial challenge to ensure the containers, tubing, and welded junctions maintained a sterile bar barrier following exposure to the intended product applications. The critical aspect of the new FPFLEX tubing is its weld welding ability, but more specifically the ability to weld post frozen storage and thawing to itself and also to CPLEX tubing, the industry standard for bioprocessing. FPFLEX tubing samples were exposed and stored in, in liquid nitrogen, thawed, and welded. All samples passed the integrity, flow rate, and weld strength test requirements. Finally, a series of drop, frozen drop tests and transportation tests were completed on the FPFLEX products to simulate potential worst case scenarios. 500 ml FPFLEX A containers in standard used aluminum cassettes were investigated and compared to similar containers having PVC tubing. Three separate studies were performed which included either a one foot drop uh, four times consecutive, consecutively or a two foot or a three foot drop following removal from liquid nitrogen storage. The FPFLEX containers passed each of the tests performed under the given conditions. To address transportation, modified ASTM scheduled e-assurance level one test was performed. Again, 500 ml FPFLEX A containers were filled with 125 ml of water, placed in the freezing cassettes and stored in a pre-filled liquid nitrogen cryo shipper. The entire container was then placed on a vibration table and vibrational shake testing was performed for a total of six hours. Each of the samples tested showed no signs of damage or leaks. So the FPFLEX products performed very well and passed all the required validation testing, but what about real life industry applications? Can single use cryogenic storage bags be used effectively for traditional working cell bank applications? This paper was published a few years ago by Seth et al. from the Late Stage Cell Culture Group within Genentech describing the use of single-use bags in comparison to the standard cryobiles to establish working cell banks for seed train scale-up and manufacturing. Using a predecessor container to the FPFLEX, the group evaluated cr critical parameters like cell volume and concentration, post-thaw performance, that demonstrated that the bags could be used effectively for working cell banks and seed train expansion manufacturing campaigns. The new FPFLEX products were just recently introduced in September, so direct in industry application and adoption is currently limited. With that said, over 25 bioprocessing and cell therapy facilities are currently evaluating the products for working cell banks and process intermediate application. Feedback thus far has been very positive. For process development purposes, working volumes of 25 ml to 100 ml have been the most common with the standard cell concentrations around 50 million cells per mil. Freezing and thawing parameters have been consistent with those already established for cryobiles, and no significant differences in post thaw recoveries and viability have been noted. Functional data is critical, as we know, and we expect to learn more in the near future. And while the proof still lies with, with the industry applications, the overall FPFLEX appeal is apparent. Using the FPFLEX method, open processing and handling can now be removed and the processing steps therefore reduced and overall seed train scale up efficiency is enhanced. To briefly summarize, FPFLEX cold chain tubing and freeze pack cryogenic storage containers were designed and are intended for ultra low frozen storage and transport applications. FPFLEX is the first of its kind to be validated for use to temperatures as low as minus 196 degrees Celsius to enable closed system continuous processing. FPFLEX freeze thaw weld make the cold chain link for working cell bank applications and improve your scale up and feed train efficiency. I want to thank you for your time and attention, and I'll now be happy to take your questions.
So can you explain how the bags are stored in comparison to vials? Yeah, so I mean, um, vials are obviously common. They're typically pretty, filled with their product, uh, placed into a container, which then is either, either placed into a container or sometimes placed into a, a controlled rate freezing device, as uh, most people are aware. The bags have a long history of of being used in the, the blood processing and transfusion areas where, again, the, there's a, a lot of experience with the bags. So the bags are placed into a, uh, the aluminum cassette, as we stated, and that maintains the one centimeter thickness, which is very similar to that of a cryovial. So once they go into these cassettes, that maintains that uniform thickness within the bag. They're placed into the uh, control grade freezing devices or the preferred method that you would use with your vial, and the same parameters are then used at that point, so you're not changing any of anything between your vial and the, uh, the bags and the cassettes. Uh, once the freezing process is complete, the cassettes are then placed into a, uh, a racking system similar to the, the racking system that the cryovials, once they're in this box, would then go into a, a racking system as well. And each of those are fitted based on the, the liquid nitrogen storage doer, uh, just the same as a vial would be. So the rack system is a change with the cassettes, but then they're, they're set up and established methods for that. And how quickly can the thaw from the largest bag be completed? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, again, just as, a, as with a thawing device, with a cryo vial, you're going to remove that vial place it into, right now, the standard is oftentimes a water bath. You would do the same thing with the bags. You can either remove them from the cassette, which is generally common, although uh, maintaining them in the cassette is possible, and again, depending on the cell model, so to minimize the handling of the, the frozen bags. Uh, but the time it takes is usually um, minimized to a couple of minutes. Again, it's, it's because of that one centimeter thickness, it's still very similar to that of a cryovial. Okay. And what is the rough timeline um, to develop the freezing procedure? Develop a freezing procedure. So the, those that we've been working with thus far um, have pretty much maintained the freezing procedure uh, and parameters that they've been using for their cryovial. So they've tried and the idea, again, with the bag, because of the history of the bags, is to minimize any change in procedures that are required other than uh, the scale up, the number of cells that need to be scaled up to bank down and so forth. But the, the freezing parameters are meant to remain very similar. So the idea is to test the samples, obtain samples and test them just as you would with your uh, current method if you're using cryovials. If you don't have a method, and we can certainly discuss uh, how to set that up. The, uh, the paper referenced um, that was published a few years back uh, by the group in Genentech does a really nice job of explaining uh, that process to, uh, to many degrees. And is there any bank stability data available, like if cells have been recovered 6 to 12 months later, identical to zero time thaws? Um, yeah, for this, for the FPplex product specifically, we don't have uh, any long-term storage data. Unfortunately, with uh, cryo storage and frozen storage, there's no um, uh, easy way to do uh, ex extended stability without actually, uh, or accelerated stability studies like you can for aging. Uh, so in order to do that, we have initiated some ongoing uh, studies, but we can't pull those until that time is up. So I'd like to reference um, historical data for products, and especially like um, hematopoietic regenerative stem cells that have been uh, stored in bags like this and others um, from transfusion applications. And there's data out there to support uh, limited to no change in recovery and viability of those cells after even storage up to 10 years. So data specific to FPplex is ongoing. And that'll be collected and, and released as we get it. But the historical data um, 
provides confidence that there should be no difference. Once they're at minus 196, ideally just like a vial, there should be no change. Okay. And what hurdles need to be overcome to switch from using vials to bags for working cell banks? Yeah, I mean, I think the obvious hurdles uh, outside of, uh, you know, we try to minimize the change based on the bag and the vial and keeping the, the same freezing and thawing parameters. So there's some, certainly some, some hurdles that have to be overcome, and that includes the, the upfront prep and scale up, uh, and also just um, the, the changes to the storage racks and so forth. But I think the, the biggest challenge right now is really just knowing how many cells per mil, what that concentration is going to be, because you're going from one ml. So if you're banking down 100 vials, you know you need 100 ml of solution with that many cells. If you're going to now do 100 bags and you want to store 100 ml in each of those bags, that scale up, that upfront scale up, is the biggest challenge. But we hope that and expect that on the back end of that, the the benefit to the commercial application and the scale up on that end should be significant. So production should be increased and quicker and more beneficial, but certainly the upfront time to develop the bank is going to be the most challenging. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dominic. And I think that's it for questions. If we didn't get to your question, uh, Dominic will be sent the questions and he can follow up with you directly. We also will be making the full presentation available in the multimedia section of our website. It will be posted at least by tomorrow and you'll be receiving an email um, that sends you a link to that information. So thank you again for all your questions and your participation and we'll see you next time.